Welcome, everyone. Um, it is wonderful to see so many faces from people I know all over the country, um, my parents included. So welcome, everyone, um, probably all over the world, as I do not know everyone here. Um, and so uh, I will just say, um, so first of all, my name is Ruth Friedman. I serve as the Maharat at Ohi Shalom, the National Synagogue in Washington, D.C., alongside Rabbi Shmuel Hertzfeld, who's here as well. Um, and the pandemic, and the, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it has opened up new ways for us to um, think about our programming and what it means to engage with, with each other and learn with each other. And so we have a wonderful opportunity today um, to have a lecture with Ilana Kirshan, um, who is currently in Jerusalem in her home. Um, and we wanted to, I wanted to thank her, first of all, just for being here today. Um, and second of all, for agreeing to work her schedule with our lunch break, um, which I know was not the most perfect time for anyone with um, family life. So, but thank you so much for doing that. A quick word just that um, we can appreciate, those of us who are not in Israel can appreciate the quirks of Israel, um, that apparently they are experiencing some power outages. And so Ilana warned me that if she disappears momentarily, it is just because she lost power, but she should be right back on. Um, and so we, we will all hold tight in the event that, that she disappears for a moment. Um, and it, yeah, so we just wanted to, to really to thank her so much for being here. Um, and, and many of you may know her um, from her wonderful book about the Dafyomi um, and st studying Talmud. And, and I know that she is a, a dear friend and, and colleague of many, many people I know, many members of our own community. And it's really just such a pleasure to have her here. Just a word about um, the logistics. And so I know that it does not automatically mute everyone. Um, and so we ask that if you can please check, check. mute yourself. If not, um, I can always jump in and mute someone if they forget by accident. And then Ilana, uh, maybe as part of your introduction, do you wanna just share what, how you would like um, folks to ask questions? Sure, great. Okay, so, great. So I'm going to mute myself now and hand it over to you. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Maharat Ruthi. Thank you, Rabbi Hertzfeld. Um, and thanks to all of you for being there. Um, um, okay, so in terms of questions, I would just say um, it's best, I think, to just write questions into the chat for now. And maybe we'll, we'll see if we have time to pause for questions somewhere in between. But I think for now, that would be best, and I'll, I'll try to relate to them. Um, um, okay, so wonderful. Um, okay, so um, what I'd like to do with you today is read with you a few Talmudic stories about, about repentance from the from Masechet of Odazara and the opening the opening chapter of that Masechet. Um, this tractate of the Talmud is about idol worship, um, and both of the stories we're going to look at contain elements of idol worship in them. Um, but I want to argue that they're really stories about, um, about our relationship with God and with ourselves, and that they touch on themes such as um, how introspection works, um, what it means to take responsibility for our lives, um, how we can face up honestly about our shortcomings without losing faith in our ability to improve. Um, I hope um, to share with you some reflections on these stories informed um, both by a close reading of some verses from this week's Parsha, um, or I should say one of this week's Parshiot, Nitzavim, um, and also, um, also informed by a recently published book about psychotherapy that was on the New York Times bestseller list for several months. Um, and although it is a book about psychotherapy, I have to tell you that the whole time I was reading this book, I was convinced it was a book about tshuva. Um, and this really made me wonder about whether tshuva and psychotherapy may not be all that different from what we might think. Um, so uh, I wanna start, uh, I wanna start with um, what I think is a rather surprising statement from the Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara. Um, and I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share my screen because I have source sheets so that you can all have the, yeah, okay. so you can all have the source sheets on your screen. So I'm gonna do that right now and hopefully you should all see um, see the source sheets in just one second. So let's see if this works. Uh, okay, does everyone see just uh, my Rath Ruthie, you see this, you see this source sheets? Okay, great. Okay, we're good. Okay, excellent. Wonderful. Okay. Um, make sure I see the chat. How do I do that? Just so I can see if anyone has forgotten. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, 
So this, the, the I, so I want to start with this prefatory um, statement from from the beginning of from the beginning of Masechet Avodah Zara. Um, before we look at our stories, um, and this statement is actually not about idolatry, um, the nominal subject of the Masechet. It's actually about Rosh Hashanah and specifically how we should daven how we should daven on Rosh Hashanah. Um, And since it is so short, just as well, and but we'll we'll shata be achid. Ave v'dachavule midre. Ihachi did tibor nami did tibor nefisha zechute. Okay. No, the internet is on. Okay. Rav Yosef says um, a person. Ah, I didn't. I didn't say, but it's attributed to Rav Yosef. A person should not recite the additional prayers musaf during the first three hours of the day on the first day of Rosh Hashanah if praying alone, individually, since the judgment of the entire world is reckoned then. Perhaps the heavenly court will scrutinize his actions and reject him. The Gemara raises a difficulty. If that is so, the prayer of the community should also not be recited at that time as well. The Gemara explains the prayer of the community is not rejected even at this time due to its many merits. Okay, so what do we have here? It's dangerous, it's dangerous to daven Musa alone early in the morning during the first three hours of the day on Rosh Hashanah. Why? Because that's when God is judging the whole world, okay? Now, this is actually a reference to something that appeared a little bit earlier on the same daf where we were given kind of um like... We were given um, sort of God's uh, God's daily schedule. What does God do every day of the year, and not just on Rosh Hashanah? And we were told that God's day is divided into twelve hours. God apparently gets more sleep than most of us. He lay low in below Yishan, so maybe not. God doesn't sleep at all, but God's day, for our purposes, is twelve hours. Um, during the first three hours, God judges the world. During the next three hours of the day, God realizes, oh my goodness, the whole world, I don't think God says that, but the whole world is doomed. God gets up from God's seat of justice and moves to sit on God's seat of mercy instead. There, God spends three hours studying Torah. Um, after those three hours, we're now on, I guess, our, uh, our, the beginning of hour six, seven, right? God then um, spends three hours feeding the world. And then for the last three hours of God's day, God plays with God's um, God's pet, the Leviathan, the, the giant sea monster that God had to subdue to, to create the world, okay? Um, so um, in other words, right, for our purposes, we need to know that in the morning, that's when God is judging, and not just every day, but at, not just on Rosh Hashanah, but every day during the first three hours of the day, God is judging the world. And if we dive in Musaf alone on Rosh Hashanah morning, the danger of that is that we might attract God's attention and God would judge us harshly. If we're the only ones davening, then all of God's attention will be focused on us. Um, when we entreat God about you know, who will live, who will die um, in the coming year. I think of this sort of like being alone in a field when lightning strikes, right? You don't wanna be the highest point in that field when lightning strikes because there are greater chances that you're gonna be the one who gets injured by the lightning. Um, Okay, but then the Talmud asks, okay, fine, I understand, right? You shouldn't daven alone on Rosh Hashanah morning, daven Musa, fine. But what about, what about, what about if you're davening with the whole community? Isn't that just as bad? Maybe we also shouldn't daven with the whole community because the whole community will, will also be subject to divine justice. And the Talmud's answer here, right, is, um, um, uh, uh, that the community has a lot of merits, right? And even if the, indi the individual has sinned grievously, that individual will be absolved on account of the collective merits of the community when that person prays. Um, this reminds me of the opening lines of Kol Nidre, when we ask God for permission, um, right, to allow us to, play, to pray with, with transgressors. Because in effect, right, on some level, all of us are transgressors, right? That's what it means to be human. And God, when God is in judgment mode, is the king whose rule is one of strict justice. And according to the rules of strict justice, none of us stands any chance of being judged favorably, right? Think of the quality of mercy soliloquy, right? None of us want to be judged when, you know, but, but by the strict rule of justice alone. But when we daven with others, God sees us for who we are, 
as all fallible human beings, each with merits and each with deficiencies. Um, because the other side of the coin is that we're not all just sinners, we're also all tzaddikim, we're also all righteous, at least some of the time. Um, and that's why I, I see this source, um, I see this source as a, as a really compelling argument for Tzvila Sibur for davening as a community. Um, I think that when we daven with others, in some sense, we're able to kind of ride on their coattails, sort of like a lagging biker drafting behind the big guys up in front, right? Or to invoke a more serious image, right? If, if prayer is truly uplifting, then it lifts all of us up to a higher, to a higher spiritual place than when we began. Um, What's that? Okay, okay. Um, but this leaves me with this question. What about now? What about this year? What about Rosh Hashanah, Tafshin, Pei Aleph, right? When we're in time of pandemic, when so many of us find ourselves davening alone, how can we find a safe way to daven even when we're by ourselves? Um, and I have to say, speaking personally for a minute, this question is particularly acute for me because I take great strength in davening with a minion. Um, I find it very hard to daven alone. I, I, I need to be part of a community, I would say mainly because I daven very, very quickly. Um, I'm always trying to squeeze more, fit more things into my day. And I think, oh, if only I daven faster, then there'll be more time to do, to do other things. Um, but when I pray with a minion, there's someone else who's setting the pace. And because I daven fast, I often have to wait right, for other people to catch up. And I find that it's, in those lulls between various brachot and various tehillim that I often figure out what it is that I'm really trying to say to God. Um, I think prayer as a community also reminds me that no matter how urgent and pressing, right, whatever it is that's weighing on me at that moment might feel, um, you know, there are always other people around us who have urgent and pressing needs. Um, and we're all united in our longing, in our striving, um, in our dreaming of more wholeness and more completion. That too is what it means to be human. Um, so, uh, so what we're going to do now, we're going to look at two stories about individuals who find themselves praying alone um, at very, very crucial moments in their lives. Um, and I want to see if perhaps they can offer us insight as we prepare for Rosh Hashanah this year. Um, both of these stories are, as I said, from Masechet Abu Dezara, um, um, and they both touch upon the issue of idolatrous pagan worship. Um, um, and the first story, um, actually, the first story begins, it's, it's, one, it's one of the first Mishnayot in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, in the first parak, um, um, in the first chapter, and it begins by sort of, because, you know, you can't, you can't not engage in idolatry until you know what would constitute engaging in idolatry. So you need to know what are these pagan festivals that we're not supposed to observe and not supposed to engage in commerce before it and what have you. Um, so we begin, this Mishnah starts with just identifying, um, you know, what is, what, what are these holidays, okay? So um, I'm going to read through, I'm going to have it on the source sheet in front of you, um, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to just read them, um, I'm just going to read them in English, I think, but, uh, you know, feel free if you see anything in the original that you want to bring in, feel free to mention it in the chat, um, and maybe I'll relate to it, um, to it a little bit. Um, okay, so, um, so the Mishnah begins by informing us what are the chief non-Jewish holidays that we're, we're, we're not supposed to observe, okay? Um, and these are the festivals of Gentiles. I'm reading section one, Kalenda, Saturnalia, and Kratisis. I, have, I don't know if I'm pronouncing those right. And the day of the festival of their kings and the birthday of the king and the anniversary of the day of the death of the king. Okay, some of these, the, the Gemara is gonna explain what they are. Um, we're gonna go on. Rav Hanan Barava says, when are these festivals celebrated? Okay, what are we talking about? Kalenda is celebrated during the eight days after the winter solstice. So I'm guessing like sort of, you know, around New Year's time, right? Saturnalia is celebrated during the eight days before the winter solstice. And your mnemonic, right? Your mnemonic to remember which festival is which, which one is Kalenda, which one is Saturnalia, is that the one that occurs after the solstice, solstice is mentioned first in the Mishnah. And the festival that takes place before the solstice is mentioned after, as in the verse, Achar Vakerem Sartani, you have hemmed me in behind and before, okay, and laid your hands upon me. This is from Tehillim. 
from Psalms where the word before appears after the term behind. Okay, what is going on here? All right, first of all, we're getting an identification of, of what two of these, of, thank you, of what, of what two of these holidays are. Um, but what's going on with this mnemonic here? The mnemonic is here to tell us that in the, how does this work? In the verse from Tehillim that's quoted as this memory aid, the word for behind, ahor, precedes, in the, in the pasuk, I mean, precedes the word for before, kedem, ahor, bakedem. Now, behind in rabbinic text refers to, actually refers to what's in the future. Because just like we don't have eyes in the back of our heads, we can't see into the future. Before, on the other hand, refers to the past, right? Like because we face what has already happened. This is what we know. This is what we are able to see. And this is how we can orient ourselves. And so in this verse, which is quoted as a mnemonic, that which is behind, that is that which is in the future, what will come later, precedes what is before, that is what's in the past. Um, but what comes earlier, which is Saturnalia, and that's why, that's how we can remember that in the Mishnah, this is really an mnemonic to remember the Mishnah, of course, because that's what Chazal really care about, much more than they care about the actual holidays, but, um, right, the, the, that's why Kalenda precedes Saturnalia, that's how we remember that Kalenda precedes Saturnalia in the Mishnah. Now, what's much more important than what comes first, what comes after, when these holidays happen, right, is the fact that they're choosing this particular pasuk as a mnemonic. Um, this particular um, parak of Tehillim, um, 139, is used very often throughout the Talmud and the Midrash, the rabbinic texts, to reflect on the experience of Adam Harishon, of Adam, okay, of the first person on earth, the first person created. Um, it comes up a lot. I'll just give you, um, I don't know, it comes up in Masachet Chagiga, in the mystical parts of Masachet Chagiga, where we learned that when Adam was created, Adam was created as a giant who extended misopa olam ba'ad sofo from one end of the earth to the other. Um, but when Adam sinned, God, um, God put God's palm on Adam's head and smushed Adam down. That's the second half of the pasuk, batashet alai kapecha, right? God puts God's palm upon, upon me, says the human being, and upon Adam. Um, and, and it squashed Adam down to normal size. Um, if there are any Dathyomi learners out there, you know, we, we saw this pasu quoted, this, this para quoted very recently um, on, on Daf Yud Zayin um, when talking about the, the Pase Bira'ot, the, 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 the um, barriers put around wells so that you can drink from a well or let your animals drink from a well on Shabbat. Um, and we were, there was a discussion about um, how Adam and Eve were created because those pillars are double-sided and Adam and Eve were apparently according to some opinions, created either facing each other or turned away from each other. And in that discussion of how Adam and Eve were created, again, we saw Achor Vakedem Tzertani. Um, I've actually had this pasuk in my head a lot lately because I'm preparing for the shiur, but I have to say that um, my oldest child has been staying up till 11 p.m. and my baby has been waking up at 4 a.m. and I keep saying Achor Vakedem Tzertani <laughs> because that's exactly how I feel. But anyway, um, okay, anyway. Um, okay, so, so, so that's what... <laughs> That's why, uh, that, okay, so, so this, the, the use of this pasuk, what I'm trying to say here, is supposed to hint to us, in a way it's hinting to us, that what's going to follow is likely to going to have something to do with Adam, okay, with Adam Harishon, and indeed, that's where we're going with this, okay, okay, so um, we're going to find out that actually, where did these holidays come from? Lo and behold, they came from Adam, um, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to read on part three. With regards to the dates of these festivals, the sages taught, when Adam, the first man, saw that the day was progressively diminishing as the days became shorter from the autumnal equinox until the winter solstice, Adam didn't know that this is a natural phenomenon, that this is how the world works, that the days get shorter, right, in, in the fall, right, in, you know, as we, where we are now, right, Shabbat is starting earlier and earlier and ending earlier and earlier, Adam didn't know that that's what happens, and Adam said, woe is me, perhaps because I sinned, the world is becoming dark around me and will ultimately return to the primordial state of chaos and disorder, tohu vavohu. And this is the death that was sentenced upon me from heaven, as it is written, the Elafar Tashuv, and to dust you shall return. Um, um, he arose, and actually that pasuk is not quoted, but it is in the, okay. He arose and spent eight days in fasting and in prayer, okay? So, so what happened? I should say first that this whole, this, whole, um, this whole source is in accordance with the opinion um, that Adam was created on Rosh Hashanah. This is an idea that comes up a lot in the Midrash. Um, I know it's in the Psikta Drav Kahan. I'm sure it's in other places too, but this notion that, um, you know, what, 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 what happened on Rosh Hashanah, that's when Adam Marishon was created. 
um, what happens then? If Adam is created on Rosh Hashanah, Adam's created like around, you know, September time, right? What is Adam experiencing? Every day, sunset is happening a little earlier. And what does Adam think? Oh my gosh, I was just told by God that I'm going to die, right? Uh, clearly, you know, I've done the world in, right? This must be all because of me. And he thought, I must be already turning to dust just days after I've been created or like right after I've been created. Um, and I think this is not uncommon, right? There's a tendency to think of natural events like that are, you know, neutral um, as reflecting our personal situation. Um, but as we're going to see, Adam is going to realize that this is not, in fact, how, how the world works. Um, I'm going to go on and then I'm going to go back. Um, okay. Once he saw that the season of Tevet, Kufat Tevet, the winter solstice, had arrived, and once Adam saw that the day was progressively lengthening after the solstice, he said, clearly the days become shorter and then longer, and this, and this is the order of the world. I mean, Hago Shalom Hu. He went and observed a festival for eight days. Upon the next year, he observed both these eight days on which he had fasted on the previous year and these eight days of his celebration as days of festivities. Adam established these festivals for the sake of heaven, but they, the later Gentiles, established them for the sake of idol worship. So what happens? Just as Adam spent eight days fasting, thinking that you know the world was returning to dust, he then spends eight days celebrating when he sees that the days are getting longer, um, but, but the Gentiles make these into pagan holidays. So, so basically, this is a story about a man who has sinned, Adam, who has sinned, and who believes that the whole world is being punished along with him. He's already learned the lesson in Gan Eden. He already learned that he can't hide from God, right? He tried that already, right? Um, right? And it, it doesn't work, right? Okay. Um, um, okay. So, um, um, so, so God's going to, but you can't hide from God. Okay. Um, and it becomes very clear to Adam that God is always going to know where he is. He realizes that God's presence is everywhere, right? Mitalech bagan l'ruach hayom, right? You can, that, that pasuk has always haunted me, right? That image of, you know, sort of like God rustling through the trees of Gan Eden, feeling God. Um, and if that's the case, he thinks, maybe the entire world is being punished for his sin. Maybe the world is getting darker because of him. Um, basically, I think Adam thinks that the world is an extension of himself and that it's being punished because of him. I think of it kind of like um, the pathetic fallacy, um, which is a literary term for attributing human qualities to things in nature that are not in fact human. It's sort of like, you know, my wife died on a rainy day and all the heavens were weeping for her loss. Um, that's sort of the idea. Um, um, I'm sorry that I lost, I hope you can still hear me. I think we lost the camera, but I'm just gonna keep talking. Just the camera, no, okay. Um, okay. Um, can everyone still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay. With, thank you. With each shorter day, time seemed to be closing in on Adam, as if the newly created world were soon coming to an end. So he turns to repentance and prayer, probably the first instance of tshuva in human history. And this is an attempt not just to save him himself, but really also to, to save the world. Um, but when I read this, it raises for me an obvious question, which is, well, why, when the days began growing longer again, follow, following the solstice, solstice, why didn't Adam assume that he had simply been forgiven, right? Wouldn't this be the natural extension of the same fallacious reasoning? Um, and I, I want to say, I think, perhaps, that with the arrival of winter, Adam realized that, oh, in fact, thank you. He and the world are not actually coterminous, right? Although Adam was created from the earth, Adam min ha'adama, he's become differentiated from it, and the earth will not be punished for his sins. Um, I think of this like the same realization that every infant must come to when it realizes that its mother is not, in fact, an extension of itself, but rather an independent being with a mind of her own, with feet that can walk away. Um, an infant is no longer part of its mother, just as Adam is no longer part of, of Adama, of mother earth. Um, um, but I think Adam was learning a lesson, not just the lesson that we all have to learn in infancy, but also throughout our lives. Um, and that is the lesson that, thank you, sweetie, that is the lesson, oh, thank you. that is lesson that are aspects, there are aspects of our lives that we can control and must control, but there are also aspects of our lives that we cannot and must not aspire to control. 
we're responsible for our behavior. We're going to be held accountable for our wrongdoings. It's up to us to fast, to pray, to do tshuva. Um, but there are many aspects of our lives that are utterly beyond our control, like the diminishing and the lengthening of days. Part of what it means to become a mature individual is to realize what we can control and what we can't. It's a humbling realization, perhaps not all that different from being squashed to normal size by a divine palm. Um, but I think once we realize the limits of our own agency, it's then that we're able to engage in true introspection with a realistic sense of, of what we can change. And paradoxically, once we do the hard work of changing ourselves, we often end up transforming our relationships. And this is something, I hope it doesn't sound trite because I really only came to appreciate this very, very recently that in life, we really can only change ourselves, right? No, no other person in our lives is ever gonna be the person we dream of them being like, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, one day I'm gonna learn to turn off the boiling water before all the water boils out. That's never gonna happen, you know? <laughs> but, right, I'm joking, you know, or one day, like, I'm not saying this right, one day my, you know, my husband is going to learn, although he never does that. I do that, but never mind. On the point being, we can't change other people. We can only change ourselves. But when we change ourselves, we're different. So our relationships with other people are different. Um, and once our relationships with other people are different, the world is different, right? We've, we've changed the world. Um, and I, I see this very much in our source because think about it. Adam's fasting and celebration led to the establishment of festive holidays for generations to come. Um, at least generations of pagans. Um, that is, we who cannot make the days longer can. You know, can start turn it off. We who cannot make the days longer can can make other people's days brighter. As Adam discovered, we who cannot change so much about the world can change ourselves, and in so doing, we can transform the world. Um, so I want to take a pause for a minute and think back to our opening source about davening Musaf alone. Um, the story about Adam's first winter highlights one of the dangers of davening alone. I think it's sort of like the stereotypes of an only child, right? The, what's the danger of being an only child? You think the whole world revolves around you, right? We, Adam was kind of like an only child. I mean, yes, there was Chava, but Chava was created as part of him, so I, I don't not, you know. Um, but, uh, but, you know, when you're the only child, you think the world revives around you. You think that everything in the world is because of you, that your actions control the world. And it's this thought that led Adam to such deep worry and distress. And I think this is a very, a very dangerous way of being in the world. By the way, I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I am not, you know, <laughs> obviously no many people you don't control if you're an only child or not if you have an only child or not i'm just i'm just playing with the stereotypes i hope that's clear um okay we're now going to move on to a story about a man who also finds himself praying alone in distress although he has a different if equally problematic sense of the relationship between himself and the world around him um and this is um the story of rabbi elazar ben dordaya um um, and I just say the story is also from the opening dafim of Masechet Abu Dazara, um, a little later, a little later um, in the parak. Um, um, and the story comes to, ch I, sh I just want to say a little bit about the immediate context, right? If we said the context of our first story was, well, in order to not engage in idolatry, we need to know what these idolatrous practices are, okay? The, the context for our second, for our second story is um, um, there's a discussion about um, sin and what happens when one repents from sin. Um, a little bit building off what we just saw. Um, and, and, and the rabbis ask, is it really true, they ask, that heresy is the only sin for which you die immediately after you repent? Or are there other sins too, which if you repent, right, then you will immediately, you'll, you'll die, right? You're not gonna be able to keep living, but you'll go to Olam Haba, okay? And that's, that's the question. And they bring our story as sort of um, like a counterexample, right? A challenge to that claim. Um, now, I just want to preface the story with, um, I just say the story is a little bit, um, I don't know what the, like a sort of, I don't know, R-rated, like a little bit off color. Um, and I kind of debated about teaching it to people, you know, on a one-off shiur. Um, but I really think that the insights it can offer us um, into tshuva and into, into the, top, the issues we're speaking about this evening um, make it worth it. So I hope you'll bear with me. Um, and, um, you know, so it goes. That's the nature of the Gemara. Um, okay. Um, that is say everything was in it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, but of course we can choose what we're going to learn, but okay. Um, so I'm going to give you the source. So this is Abu Dazra Yudzayin. Um, this is the second of the two stories I want to look at. Okay. Um, and I will read. Okay. Wait, I just, I, I, I can't see the chat, but I hope, hope everyone's following and, and with me. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna read. They, thanks. Oh no, I think it's all good. Oh, perfect, okay. Um, okay, great, thank you, okay. Um, they said about, Re perfect, all good, yep. They said about Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya that he did not leave one prostitute in the world with whom he did not engage in sexual intercourse. In other words, he had to sleep with every prostitute in the world. Once he heard that there was one prostitute in one of the cities overseas who would take a purse full of dinars as her payment. In other words, a lot of money, okay? He took a purse full of dinars and went and crossed seven rivers to reach her, okay? So um, first of all, I want to say, why is this in Masachet Avodah Zarah, right? Well, for one, I think Ben Dordaya's, this rabbi's addiction to prostitutes is presented as a kind of Avodah Zarah, right? He pursues these prostitutes with a sort of religious zeal, leaving no stone unturned. He's going to go, you know, to the furthest over city, over sea, cross seven rivers, right? He's going to reach her in any time in life when something becomes so important to us that we're willing to sacrifice everything for it, whether it's, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know, becoming, becoming so wealthy or becoming so thin or becoming the perfect parent or whatever it is that we hold up as, you know, we're going to do everything for this to happen. There is an element of idolatry in it. Um, and I think that's true of, of Ben Jordaya. Um, he, it, it takes great effort and the, 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 source, the source emphasizes the effort it takes to go see her, that she's in the cities overseas. These seven, seven is just a big number, right? Crossing seven rivers. Um, I think also that distance serves to emphasize that she's very far removed from his natural milieu, right? He's a rabbi. <laughs> she's something, right? She's kind of othered in three ways, right? Not only is she not just, she's, she's, she's not a man, she's a woman. She's not a Jew. Um, um, well, okay, I'm good. So we don't know that for sure. Let's say I'm going to say she's not Jewish, and okay for now. Um, and um, and also she's uh, she she's you know he she represents sin, which is presumably the opposite of what he represents as a rabbi. Okay, so um, she's very she's in, should be very far removed from his milieu. Um, um, I think there's something sort of obsessive compulsive about his quest to see to see every prostitute to when he hears about this ultimate conquest he must. Um, but as we're going to discover. Um, um, Rabbi Elazar is not really after physical gratification, um, I, I think. I think he's compulsively driven to, to see every prostitute because of some sort of spiritual drive inside himself. Um, I also want to say one thing about the, the larger historical context for this rabbi prostitute story. Um, um, we know that there were a lot of narratives in early Christian literature contemporaneous with the Amoraim, with this source, with Talmudic material, about prostitutes who, uh, like about a prostitute who encountered a holy man and was inspired to repent and become a celibate nun, of course. Um, and all these stories were written to praise the holy man who was able to get even this confirmed sinner, right, of a prostitute to repent. Um, and in a way, the Rabbi Elazar ben Nerdaya story kind of turns that on its head because as we're going to see in this story, the prostitute actually becomes an agent of God, right? She's doing the holy work. And he's he's the repentant sinner. Um, so I hope I, that wasn't a little bit of a spoiler. But um, but if anyone's like you know, oh no, this is so anti-feminist. I just wanted to say that that first. Um, um, you know, like yes, it's true that you know, he's the rabbi, she's the prostitute, but but he's the sinner. Okay, um, and and she's the opposite. Okay, um, so that was just um, by the way. Okay, um, part two. When they were engaged in the matters to which they were accustomed, okay, lovely uh, Talmudic euphemism, bishat her gildavar, um, she passed wind, okay, heficha, um, she passed wind and said, just as this past wind will not return to its place, so too Elazar ben Dordaya will not be accepted in repentance. Okay, so what is going on here? Um, and I'm, like, again, I'm sorry, this is a little off color. I hope I can redeem this word. Um, so, okay, she passes wind, which for one, I think, serves to undo her eroticization. If we're talking about, you know, is there any feminist element in the story, right? If she, if she's passing wind, she can't possibly be just this alluring, like, sex object, okay? Um, also, she refers to what happened. She calls it by name immediately after it happens. She's clearly not a person who's embarrassed by bodily things, who covers up bodily things. It's all out there. It's all naked. It, it's all in the open. Um, her passing wind doesn't embarrass her. It actually turns her in a way from prostitute to prophetess, right? She begins to predict what's going to happen, right? Just as this past wind will not return to its place, so too Elazar ben Jordaya won't be allowed to repent. This reminds me a little bit of, I think it's like right, a Hasidic story about the, you know, what is Lashon Hara like? It's like, you know, you cast all the feathers into the wind. You can never get back all those feathers. So too, right? Rebel Elazar ben Jordaya, he'll never be able to come back. Um, 
okay? Um, but more than that, right? I want to think about why, like, what is this? Your image has dropped. You can still hear me. Okay, let me keep talking. I'm sorry about the camera. I think it's plus of it dropped. You can hear me. Uh, no, 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 my internet. Can you hear me? Yeah, they can hear me. Okay. okay, okay. I'm sorry about the trouble. Okay. Passing wind, speaking of things we can't control, the internet and the power are something we definitely cannot control, the less. Um, okay, well, Matan can control it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, so passing wind punctures our false inflated projection of control. Um, ben Jordaya is going to have to realize that in order to change, it can't come through fighting for control. It's only by developing a realistic sense of what he can and can't control that he's going to be able to, to change his ways. Also, um, I want to point out that the word used for this passing of wind, hefika, is the same root word used in the story of in Breshit for the creation of Adam, of Adam, right? Vayipach be'apav nishmat chayim, right? How does God create Adam? God creates soil from the earth and God breathes into that soil. God breathes life into that soil. Um, so in a way, right, the gas that's released from the prostitute is sort of the analog of the neshama, the, 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 the spirit, the, the breath that was inspirited, inspired into the first human being and brought him to life. Um, it's reminded of you know, what we say in Elohai Neshama, right, that, you know, the, the, the tefillah we say every morning that God fashioned our souls, God breathes life into us and preserves life in us. Um, it's, it's interesting that in Judaism, right, the word that's used for, for soul always has something to do with breathing, ruach, nefesh, neshama, hevel, right, from Kohelet, hevel, pe, um, okay, which is shallow breath. Um, and and I, I should say about Kohelet, like really Kohelet is obsessed with this notion that all that separates life, all that separates life from death is, is hevel, right? And all of Kohelet is this meditation on mortality. All human existence is overshadowed by this idea that we are going to die. Um, and, uh, and, and her passing of wind, in a way, reminds him, Rabbi Elazar Bernardaya, that he too at some point is going to not just breathe in, but breathe out his last breath, that he's going to expire. Um, so um, I think in a way, right, part of what's happening at this moment is that Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya is shifting from a state of spiritual death to spiritual life. Um, and this is what's going to move him to repentance. Um, so um, let's finish the story. Um, okay, part three. He went and sat between two mountains and hills and said, mountains and, oh, thank you. mountains and hills, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf, as it is stated, for the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed from Yishael. He said, heaven and earth, pray for mercy on my behalf. By the way, if the sounds, if, I don't know if this echoes for anyone, Bialik took the first line of his famous poem, Ala Shita, I think from this story, right? Shamayim Bikshu Alei Rachamim. Okay, if it sounds familiar to anyone, if that's all. Okay. Um, they said to him, before we pray for mercy on your own behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf, as it is stated, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax like an old garment. He said, sun and moon, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf, as it is stated, then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed. He said, stars and constellations, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf, as it is stated, and all the hosts of heaven shall molder, shall molder away. Okay, so first of all, why is Rabbi Lazar ben Jordaya appealing to the mountains, to the hills, to the stars, to everything around him? Well, don't forget, this is Masachet Abu Dazarah. That's what all the other nations worshipped, right? Those are the pagan gods. Um, but Dordaya is kind of obsessed with worshiping all these pagan gods and avoiding true repentance, right? He's not quite able to, to look inside himself yet. Um, but alas, no part of nature is willing to look out for Rebbe Lazar ben Dordaya. They're all too busy looking out for themselves. And Rebbe Lazar ben Dordaya is going to have to do some, some serious work here, um, some serious inner work. Okay, part four. El Lazar ben Dordaya said, clearly the matter depends on nothing other than myself. Ein hadavar talui ela bi. Okay, it's a line I keep saying to myself throughout this entire, all of like this elo period. I, I've said this to myself again and again. If you're going to take one thing away from the shir, lay it be. Ein hadavar talui ela bi. This depends only on me. This is up to me. He placed his head between his knees and cried loudly until his soul left his body. 
okay? Ad she'at tani shmato, which also reminds me of the, of the wind, right? The passing wind. A divine voice emerged and said, Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya is destined for life in the world to come. When Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi heard this story, he wept and said, there is one who acquires his share in the world to come only after many years of toil. And there is one who acquires his share in the world to come, yesh kone olamo, in one moment. And Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi further says, not only are penitents accepted, but they're even called Rebbe, they're even called Rabbi. Okay, so, so what's happening here? Um, um, okay, well, you know what? I'll just quickly say about Rebbe's reaction because that's sort of a little bit distracting from what I really want to focus on, right? What happens? Rebbe Zavadodaya dies and immediately goes to heaven, right? His 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 act of repentance um, results in his death um, and his sort of spiritual absorption. Um, and Rebbe is very resentful because after all, Rebbe is, you know, the rabbinic, <laughs> the symbol of the rabbinic establishment as Rebbe, the editor of the Mishnah, right? So actually, this is also where in Eretz Yisrael, we're in the early third century, in case you were wondering. Um, right? He spent his whole life struggling to do Torah and mitzvot, and then this one guy, Elazar ben Dordaya, who was like scum of the earth, right? Like who did all these terrible things, he just repents and in a second he gets accepted. Like that doesn't seem to be fair. Reminds me a little bit of the opposition to Chonia and Agel. I don't know. Okay. Um, but you know, and he may be thinking to himself, and wait a second, like this is not how tshuva is supposed to work. It's not supposed to be like this quick fix. You know, I sort of think it's almost like, you know, you have someone who spends their whole life trying to eat really healthily and not eat any junk. And then they have this overweight friend who like in the space of three days, or I don't know, you know, like instantaneously loses all this weight. And, they, and the other, the person says, how did you do it? And he says, oh, haven't you heard of Slim Fast? I drink Slim Fast for three days. I don't know that. I don't even know if there's still Slim Fast. That's what came to my head. But I think last time I, well, never mind. Anyway, you know what I mean? Like I drink this magical diet drink and now I'm perfectly thin, right? Like you, how would you feel? You'd be so angry. I've spent my whole life trying to eat healthily. And, you just lost all that weight. Like that's sort of my uh, my image for, for what's happening here. Um, okay, but I I, I want to forget Rebbe for a minute, right? So what happens when Rebbe Lazar and Dardai says, clearly the matter depends only on me. Okay, so this is a rabbi. I'm sorry, I know the camera's off again. I apologize. No, okay, thank you. Okay, this is the rabbi who has is seeking something very far away, right across seven rivers overseas. But ultimately, he discovers that what he's really looking for is is inside himself. And this brings me to some sukim from this week's parsha from Nitzavim. Um, and I'm just scrolling down. Although I will go back. Um, um, from okay, so I'm just gonna read. Uh, uh, gosh, I, I can't. It like kills me to read it. I'm gonna read it in Hebrew. Kia mitzvah zot asher anochi mitzavcha hayom lo nifleti mimcha v'lo rechokahi lo v'shamayim hi lemor miyale lanu hashamayim av yikachet lanu dishmenu ota. Okay, I'm not gonna read all the benasena v'lo me ever layam hi lemor. Mi avor lanu el ever hayam v'yikachet lanu v'yishmienu ota benasena ki karov elecha hadavar meod. Um, okay, so uh, it's enough for now, right? This mitzvah that I'm giving you, th th this mitzvah that I'm giving you, that I'm giving you today, it's not so distant from you. It is not in the heaven as if to say, who will help us ascend to the heavens and take it for us? It is not, as, and bring it to us so we can do it. It is not across the sea. It's not across seven rivers, right? As if to say, who will take us across to the other side of the sea and do it for us? Rather, this thing is very close to you, in your mouth and in your heart, to do it. Look, says God, I have given you today life and goodness and death and evil, right? So much more poetic in the Hebrew, right? I have given before you blessing and curse, and you shall choose life, and you shall choose life so, so that you will live, okay? Um, I think, um, you know, I should say, you know, what is this thing that we're being given? At least according to the Ramban, this is a reference to tshuva. But tshuva, it's not something so far removed, this mitzvah. It's not something so difficult to attain. It's actually right here in us for the taking. Um, and what happens with Rabbi Lazar ben Dordaya, when he looks so far away, when he looks across the seas, I'm going back to our story, when he looks across the mountains, right? He, it reminds me a little bit of the shift that happens in um, in in Esayin Ayel Harim in uh, in 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 Tilim Kuf Chafalis. Um, you know, I, I didn't give you the source, but you know, I, I lift up my eyes to the heavens. Where will my help come from? Right? I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where will my where will my help come from? Um, which is what Rabbi Lazar Ben does. He says, "Mountains, come help me." But he 
But then, right, the religious person realizes, wait a second, it's not really about the mountains because there is some, someone, something that creates the mountains. Ezri me'im Hashem oseh shamayim ba'aretz, right? From El Shaddai who said die to the mountains, right? From, from God who limited creation. That's where, that's where the real help comes from. Only when Rabbi Elazar exhausts the search for help outside himself does he arrive at the realization that in fact, God is inside him. He may not be able to control himself when it comes to sin, but he can seize control of the process of his own repentance. And that's something that no one can do for him, right? He has to, he has to do it for himself. Um, now, if I wanna to try to link these two stories that we saw, the story about Adam um, seeing the sun set earlier and earlier and thinking the world is ending, and the story about Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya, I would say that, right, what's happening here, Adam imagines the whole world as an extension of himself because the whole world is being punished alongside him. Elazar ben Dordaya imagines the whole world as an extension of himself because he thinks the whole world can rally to his aid and repent for him. But each one has to develop a more healthy relationship between self and world. That is, a more healthy sense of personal responsibility. Not everything in the world is a reflection of ourselves. I actually think that the camera's broken, like just to remind me of this lesson, that's why the camera keeps going off, lest I forget, right? Um, not everything can we control, but we have to control what it is, what it is that we can control. Um, and this brings me to some thoughts about therapy. And I, I included at the end of our source sheet on the bottom here, um, three quotes from a book entitled, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone by Lori Gottlieb. Um, I should say this is sort of the last book that I would ever read. I almost never read nonfiction and I avoid like a great aversion to self-help. <laughs> um, but um, not because I think I don't need to be helped, actually the opposite, but, um, but I, I just don't like the genre. But, um, but I, have, I have two sisters-in-law who are psychotherapists and um, we were all the way on a vacation together and they were reading this book and talking about it and um, talking about it all the time. And I said, I guess I have to pick up this book so I can talk to them. And I started reading and became very intrigued. It was last summer that this happened. So I was already kind of in an LO mindset. Um, and I think the book sort of stayed in the back of my head all year. Um, and as I was, I was preparing this year, I was reminded, I was reminded of a lot from this book. Um, um, I imagine some of you read it since it was a, it was a bestseller for many months. Um, so I, I brought three quotes that I want to just read in the context of the stories that we read um, and, and think, about, think about what they have to say to us um, about, about Shuba and about where we are in the Jewish year. Um, so I'm going to read the first of the three passages. This is, again, a quote from Lori Gottlieb. Um, Therapy is hard work and not just for the therapist. That's because the responsibility for change lies squarely with the patient. If you expect an hour of sympathetic head nodding, you have come to the wrong place. Therapists will be supportive, but our support is for your growth. The therapist's role is to understand your perspective, but not necessarily to endorse it. In therapy, you're asked to be both accountable and vulnerable. Rather than steering people straight to the heart of the problem, we nudge them to arrive there on their own because the most powerful truths, the ones people take the most seriously, are those they come to little by little on their own. Ein hadavar talui elabi. The patient must be willing to tolerate discomfort because some discomfort is unavoidable for the process to be effective. Um, I think that in the story of Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya, the prostitute serves as a kind of therapist guiding Elazar ben Dordaya to change what he needs to change about himself. She's not really sympathetic, but she ultimately gets him to where he needs to be. She makes him feel uncomfortable with that awkward passing of wind, and that discomfort leads him to repentance. Um, and, and with that passing of wind, she reminds him of his own mortality, of the divine breath breathed into him, of the fate that awaits him if he doesn't change his ways. Um, and he realizes this is something that he's, he's going to have to do for himself. He's going to have to tolerate that discomfort. He's going to have to put his head between his knees and it's all going to have to come from him. By the way, that image of him putting his head between his knees, I also think of, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot you can do with that, but, but one thing I'll say is the knees also remind me of the mountains, right? It's the mountains are not outside of me. When you put your head, I'm not doing it now because I'm on Zoom, but when you put your head between your knees, right, you're, you're making your knees into the mountains. You're realizing that I am the mountains. I am the, I am like a sign al harim, but the harim are actually my own, my own knees. I am the help. Okay, that I see. I'm sort of very, um, okay, um, okay. Um, not to mention what you're looking at if you're seeking all these prostitutes and you're putting your head between your knees, but I said I wouldn't be too off color. Okay, 
part two, source two. Some people hope that therapy will help them find a way to be heard by whoever they feel wronged them, at which point those lovers or relatives will see the light and become the people they'd wished for all along. At some point, being a fulfilled adult means taking responsibility for the course of your own life and accepting the fact that now you're in charge of your choices. You have to move to the front seat, okay? In other words, we can only change ourselves and only when we realize this can work but as I said earlier um, when we change ourselves our relationship with others begins to change and when our relationships with others begin to change the world begins to change and so by changing others and the world and so the only way to change others and the world is really to change ourselves um, I was thinking about how chuva, right? Chuva, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of making this analogy between chuva and therapy and saying that chuva is really, it should be a lifelong process, right? We work, we should be working on ourselves all year long, but Rosh Hashanah is kind of like the, the super intense time when chuva becomes almost our total focus, right? I think of it as like, um, I actually don't know how to pronounce this, but I think it's called HIIT, H-I-I-T, high intensity interval training. Um, for chuva, like, which is a kind of exercise where you do super, super intense for 30 seconds, and then, you know, you do other things, and then super intense again, that Rosh Hashanah is kind of like a high intensity interval for chuva, right? And the rest of the year, we kind of, you know, I don't know, run at a more relaxed pace or whatever. Um, but, um, but, but, um, but Elul is the time when we give it our all as if we have nothing nothing to lose, right? Nothing else to give because we really do have nothing to lose, right? Our lives hang in the balance. right? Um, this is the time of year. Um, but of course, you know, um, um, it really can only happen when you will it to happen, when you want it to happen, right? You can play endless exercise videos while lying on the couch, you know? Um, nothing's gonna happen. <laughs> okay, um, okay. And now the third source. We talk to ourselves more than to any other person over the course of our lives, but our words aren't always kind or true or helpful or even respectful. Most of what we say to ourselves, we would never say to the people we love or care about, like our friends or children. In therapy, we learn to pay close attention to those voices in our heads so that we can learn a better way to communicate with ourselves. Um, when Rabbi Elazar ben Jordaya finally stops appealing to the heavens and the stars and the mountains, he's forced to confront himself. Um, and it's at, I think this is very true that when we are alone, we are most attuned, we're especially attuned to those voices inside of us. If anyone's ever lied awake with insomnia, you know this is true. Um, this is good, but it can also be dangerous, right? How can we more effectively speak to ourselves and how can we remain attuned to the voices inside ourselves without losing sight of the world around us? Um, to go back for a moment to the first source we began about davening alone on Rosh Hashanah, we don't want to daven alone on Rosh Hashanah lest we be judged too harshly. But I think the converse is that when we're alone, we actually have the greatest possibility for intimacy with God. There's no such thing as sinning when no one else is watching, right? Adam couldn't hide from God in the garden. Elazar can't lose himself amidst the mountains because God is always watching. Um, and so while it may be true that when we're davening alone, right, all of the divine energy is focused on our sins, that's one way of looking at it, but the cup is also half full. When we're davening alone, we're alone with God. And what an opportunity that is. Um, I'm thinking of there's a Gemara in Kiddushin. Kol ha'over avera v'seiter ki'ilu dochek raglei ha'shechina. Anyone who sins when they're in secret, it's as if they're pushing away or bumping up against the legs of the divine presence. Um, and the proof text that Chazal cite is genius, is from Yeshayahu Samech Vav. Hashamayim kisi v'haretz hadom raglai, says God. The the um, the uh, the he the sky the heavens are my seat are my throne and the earth is my stool right this image of God sitting in the heavens with God's feet dangling down to earth and any time we sin it's as if we're bumping up against God's legs or pretending God is not there by sinning in secret we're we're essentially denying God's omnipresence far more brazenly than when we're when we're sinning in public. Um, this is why I never trust anyone who says they don't need God to be a moral person, right? Because 
What's going to keep us in check when no one's watching, right? This is why a religious consciousness is so essential. Um, in Judaism, it's never an ideal to daven alone. We need our communities. They support us. They nourish us. They uplift us spiritually. But at a time when we find ourselves more alone than we otherwise would be, but not because we planned it this way, but because circumstances have unfortunately necessitated it, perhaps we can hope that our aloneness will be an occasion for spiritual growth. May we use this Yamim Noraim season of pandemic to allow our aloneness to be an occasion for intimacy with God, an intimacy that inspires us to take responsibility for our actions, to change ourselves, and in so doing, by extension, to transform the world of which we are a part. So Shana Tova, and thank you all so much. A wonderful shiur. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, um, really, for everything um, and the true incredible ability to multitask and to, to keep calm, um, I think is an inspiration for all of us in this time. Um, so first of all, uh, if, we, if anyone wants to um, ask a question either by unmuting yourselves or typing in the chat, I think we've got just two minutes for our questions. And also, Alana, I'm seeing that there have been a couple requests for the source sheet. So perhaps sure. if, if it's possible to include sure. the link here in the chat for that, that no would be problem. great as well. No problem. I can do that. Yep, I'll do that. Thank you. So if anyone just wants to ask um, a quick question, you can please just unmute yourselves. Um, a question here. Um, isn't psychotherapy and secular self-help um, just really an attempt to do what religious institutions do in the way of chuva? Maybe in a, in my opinion, in a weaker way than a religious heritage can do it. Can you talk yes. about that? Yeah. So I think I think that's a little bit of. Um, just pasting that link. Okay, that's a link to the source sheet. Okay. Um, I think, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just give me one second. I'm sorry, because I can't, this time I can't multitask. Hold on. Everyone, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so how much I'm like, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to argue more or less is that there's a lot in common between the process of chuva and the process of psychotherapy. But for me personally, I've always been a deep believer in the power of chuva and also in the importance of having a focused time of year when, you know, we're really, really intent on chuva. Um, because, you know, if you can do something all the time, as we all know, you never do it, right? Um, it's only when you have a deadline that you actually do it, um, which is why this is so important this time of year. Um, but, but while I've always been a deep believer in chuva, I've also always been been a deep skeptic about, um, about therapy's effectiveness um, for many, many reasons. Um, and part of what reading this book and um, helped me understand is that what I value so much about Shuva, right, there's in psychotherapy that has that as well. And perhaps that there's, there's, there are insights to be gleaned from psychotherapy that can shed light on the Shuva process and vice versa. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, that's where I am right now. Yeah, Any, thank you. Sure. Okay, we'll turn it off again. Okay. Any more questions? Anyone else has one? Just unmute yourselves. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, people might be shy. Um, okay, so in that case, um, Alana, really, thank you again um, for this just really, really wonderful talk. And I, I so appreciate that you are addressing questions that are just oh so very relevant this year. Um, thank you to everyone for joining. Hopefully you all see the link um, at the bottom here in the chat. And also we've been recording and so the recording will be available as well and we'll send that around. So have a wonderful, wonderful evening if you're in Israel um, and a great afternoon if you are not. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, my friends. I also would like to uh, remind people, first of all, thank you, Alana, for a very, very uh, brilliant class. I want to remind people that tomorrow night, Marat is leading an incredible program uh, where, where she's studying from, from about activism and growth and pain from Chana, uh, who's after Rosh Hashanah, to John Lewis. And we're doing something, we're actually doing something that's never been done. We're, we're, we're trying something with a beta shul for Safaria, where people are going to come on through Chavruta and be randomly assigned to other 
uh, individuals from this class from, who sign on to the program and be signed to study Bechavruta. And then Marat will bring it all together for a discussion. And so I don't know if Marat wants to uh, answer or talk to that. Uh, no, that sounded great. Thank you. I totally forgot to promote my own class. Um, thank you for that. And if you're local, we'll also be having the delivery from Omama Grill. Um, and so just uh, call them by five o'clock today to place your order. Just email me if anybody has any questions. Um, I'll also post the info for that as well on Facebook. And one more thing, Alana. Yes. Alana, can we yes. give a big, big shout out to your uh, assistant for being an amazing, <laughs> amazing star? Uh, the only thing better than your brilliance is seeing how he helps his mother. He's very, very beautiful to see. Thank you very much. Thank you. You couldn't hear? Oh, oh, okay, I'll tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Matan. Okay. So Sanatoba. Everybody buy Alana's book. It's a brilliant book and everybody should buy it. Sanatoba.